that. Right. So a few, a few uh, hands are going up. Super. Uh, so instruction design is uh, essentially just as the name suggests. It's purposeful creation for easy learning and application. Uh, as educators, as teachers, we are constantly creating different things for children uh, in the classroom, right? We, a, we're either creating a lesson plan, we are creating a kind of a learning experience, we are creating collaterals when it comes to learning, we are creating assessments, we are creating different tools to help them learn better, uh, we are creating an experience for the class as a whole, right? When you're designing say, quiz competitions or when you're uh, you know, when you're doing, say, for example, a role play based task <clears throat> in our journey in the classroom, we're constantly creating things for children. Instruction design adds the word purposeful in front of creation to remind us that everything that we want to do in the classroom, want to achieve in the classroom has to be aligned with a certain purpose or a certain goal right? Um, we want the children to be able to apply what we are teaching. We want them to connect what they already know to what we teach and then expand their understanding. Uh, and so instruction design is kind of, you know, bringing mindfulness uh, back into designing of learning experiences in the classroom. And this, you know, this word purposeful is so beautiful because from the moment we identify the goal of something that we want to achieve in a 40 minute period, the whole journey of kind of creation towards that goal is then dedicated by action words or verbs, right? And the verbs that we choose to uh, to communicate something kind of make all the difference. So purposeful creation for easy learning and application is instruction design. Uh, it is kind of, um, like I said, it is all about alignment. There are goals and objectives that we want to meet in the classroom. There are teaching and learning activities that have to be designed in order to suit that goal and at the end of the day when we want to assess how children have learned when we want feedback on uh, on how our design is reaching them at the end of the day it has to be a, a beautifully aligned experience for children so if I could take if I could request you to take just two things away uh, from the concept of instruction design it's two words literally it is purposeful and alignment now, why are we, dis why are we discussing uh, instruction design in a session on assessments? Well, assessments are a form of application, right? This is one of the ways in which we understand how children learn. It's one of the ways in which we understand how children have received what we have learned. And honestly, uh, as teachers, assessments are useful to us and the learners only if they are planned well, right? Uh, not you know, just having a test versus having a really well designed test makes a big difference. Your goal at every given point in time is to understand how well your children are doing, how how well they are progressing on their understanding journey, and purposefully aligned assessment, purposefully created aligned assessments are a great way to do that. So uh, today's session, we are going to be talking uh, about multiple choice questions uh, and, uh, uh, you know, to bring some levity to the day, a lot of the time, multiple choice questions is, uh, especially when we were children, it was all about, oh, eeny, weeny, miny, mo, uh, you know, you, you do that, you choose the answer or you say, oh, this looks the longest or this looks the shortest, maybe this is the, this is the answer, right? Uh, behind uh, an MCQ that you see on a computer screen or a phone or or printed in a booklet in front of you is like I was telling you, uh, uh, a notoriously difficult process of creation. And there are 11 or 12 steps in a checklist that we have to go through while we are creating multiple choice assessments to make sure that uh, uh, a, a, a question that helps us actually know something about the child is getting put on the paper. Now, we all know what MCQs are, uh, very simple. It is a form of an objective assessment in which a test taker either reads something or listens to something or watches a question and they choose the best answer from a set of options. Now here, I want to just take a second and bring your attention to the word best answer and not the correct answer. 
um you know if i could just invite uh, one or two people to unmute and share why do you think uh, you know in the instruction we use the best answer and not the correct answer aditi probably the distractors are very close to each other yeah and the distractors possible one of the distractors may be uh, an option for some children because we are also working on the misconceptions right so the distractors ought to be very close correct so if the distractors are very close to each other then uh, we use the word best thank you anu ma'am good to see you here again um anyone else no so uh, like anu ma'am said you know uh, a lot of the times uh, when we are uh, using uh, the mcqs to assess something in children we also want to assess what what their thinking process is you know uh, and there are different kinds of mcqs that are created to test two tier thinking uh, and that's a great way to kind of you know not focus on what the correct answer to a question is but how a child really thinks and the best answer for me in some cases may not be the best answer for komal and i should be able to provide my reasoning for it right uh, so when we are creating mcqs the first thing that we do is write the instruction on top right uh, choose the correct answer from the following options for these questions uh, especially for older children choose the best answer from a set of options could be a better instruction uh, to give rather than choose the right answer from the correct options the other thing is uh, especially in languages the right answer is usually about uh, questions that are related to the ability to remember something to recall something uh, you know or to understand something but higher order things like maybe evaluation or analysis uh, there may not be the 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 correct answer but a best answer based on reasoning will be there right so when we go from lots to hots as we say from lower order to higher order thinking uh, it becomes important that the instructions that we give the children also uh, you know also have the same kind of uh, same expansion so to speak uh <clears throat> like i said uh, like uh, anu ma'am also said um, you know every multiple choice question has uh, you know uh, the whole piece is called a test item there is an anatomy of mcqs uh, as you can see on the screen um, you know the sentence say for example ali's baby blanket is spectacular a synonym of the word spectacular is dash that is the stem uh, which is the question statement and in the question statement we can often see that uh, the question statement is divided in two parts uh, the first part is kind of a context so where we see the sentence ali's baby blanket is spectacular that is a context that builds the base for the question that is about to come which is a synonym of the word spectacular is dash so the whole piece uh, you know the whole question statement is called the stem uh, and then we have four options under the question statement uh, the correct response is called a key and the uh, incorrect responses are called distractors distractors are options that we give uh, along with the key and the child has to choose what the right answer is now there is also often some kind of um, you know uh, there is a healthy debate which says that oh, what's the right number of options to have you know should we have three uh, distractors or should we have uh, five should we have four um, and the general consensus is that when children are older say grade 7 and above four distractors is a good amount of distractors to have it's a healthy number of distractors to have all uh, all international assessments also have four distractors uh, you know when i say four distractors i mean one key and three distractors um and uh, from a creation point of view right because it's it may be easy to come up with the question for us as teachers but to actually create a more number of distractors that meet the rule criteria that we have is actually a very difficult job and so uh, for the creator and for the test taker four distractors is a good number of distractors to have uh, three distractors and one key and the whole piece right were uh, from the question statement the stem the correct response and the distractors the whole piece is called a test item uh what we are going to visit now very quickly is uh, a few rules for uh, creating multiple choice questions um you know for some of you it may 
we what you already know for some of you it may be new so uh, we will go through this uh, fairly quickly um and actually these are you know these guidelines so to say you can then just print them off and stick them in your staff room or share it with your teams so when your teams are creating mcqs if you find that your mcqs are able to pass these 11 checklists you have a great set of questions that are ready for the children uh, so the first is uh, the STEM must contain a self-contained question. And what do we mean by this? Uh, let's take this box that we see on the screen as an example. Uh, the text in red is the English language. Uh, and then we have four uh, options, right? Uh, the English language dot dot dot. Option A is more common as a first language than as a second language. Was originally derived from a number of other languages is the oldest living European language. It became the world's lingua franca in the 20th century. Now, if you look at this particular uh, test item, if you were just to look at the question stem, uh, can someone tell me what the question stem is in this case? The English language? Yes, Raki ma'am. Thank you so much. The question stem, Raki ma'am, is it asking you a question or do you know what to answer by just reading the stem it's not actually asking any question it's just to complete a statement we can say that correct so uh, a good mcq is actually where the stem contains the question where the child does not need to look at the distractors in order to understand what the question is right? Uh, and you can see how the same question has been rephrased in the second box that appeared on the right. The primary reason why English became established as a global language is a result of. Uh, so in this case, Raki ma'am, uh, do you know what is being asked of you? Yes. So you know that you have to think about a primary reason why mm -hmm. English became what it is, right? Yes, and then yes. the four options are to help you choose the best uh, response to those, uh, you know, to this question. Mm -hmm. So the first uh, question, the first uh, principle is that the STEM must contain a self-contained question, an incomplete STEM where the child needs to look at the distractors in order to respond to the question is not a well-drafted multiple choice question. The second is uh, related to the first which is the STEM must contain as much of the item's content as possible. Like we visited a few slides ago, test item is everything, right? You have the question uh, statement, you have the key, you have the distractors, everything is the test item. And the STEM must contain as much of the item's content as possible. Um, if we look at this box that's on the screen, uh, um, can someone uh, read out the STEM here? Jimmy des Jenny decided to. Jenny decided to. Thank you, Anu, ma'am. Uh, in this case as well, uh, you know, the question is not clear in the STEM. Um, versus if you look at the uh, text that appears on the box on the right, uh, what did Jenny decide to do after she finished the university? And then you have a set of four options. So like we said earlier, uh, the children should not need distractors in order to understand the question or infer the question. And this is the most basic rule of, uh, of creating a well-drafted MCQ. Uh, the STEM must contain as much of the item's content as possible. Is this clear so far? You can just show me a quick thumbs up. Super. Thank you. Moving on. Where possible... Avoid negatively worded stems. Now, this is a uh, this is a big one, right? And there can be a lot of contention around this. Um, who can tell me uh, what is a negatively worded stem? Anyone? Which Basically, contains not. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, ma no, you go on, Raki. Uh, Negative state, uh, stem is uh, which contains not in it, no, or negative statements like that. Yeah, correct. Thank you so much, uh, Seema is... ma'am. Also, you've written on chat. Uh, there is a negation in the stem, right? So you have a not or wouldn't or couldn't or didn't or, uh, you know, never, something like that. Um, so can someone please read the whole test item here? 
which of the following is not located in Asia? Yeah. The whole test system. So what is the whole test item? The whole test item is the stem the key and the distractors, right? So the whole text is the whole text, the whole test item. Uh, which of the following cities is not located in Asia? London, New York, Lima, Seoul. And if you see how the question is drafted on the right-hand side of the board, uh, uh, can somebody read this out for me? Which of the following cities is located outside Asia? London, Dubai, Delhi, and Seoul. Great. Um, so, uh, are you able to see the difference between the way the two stems are worded? Uh, the question yeah. that we are asking is the same, uh, but we are not using the word not or a negatively worded uh, or a negative worded uh, word in the stem. This is mainly because, uh, you know, when in a test taking environment, uh, regardless of the age of the child, the students observe, uh, you know, they often fail to observe negative learning because we are reading quite fast uh, and it can confuse them. As a result, students who are familiar with the material as well uh, tend to make mistakes on a negatively worded uh, stem. Now, you know, sometimes we say that, but children should pay attention and we want them to read the question carefully. And that's why we are asking, uh, you know, questions like this. So, yes, it is possible. And in those cases, the negatively, uh, sorry, in those cases where we, act, we do want to highlight a negation in the stem, we have to make sure that we have emphasized the keywords by putting them in bold along with an underline. Um, you know, uh, uh, English or a language assessment is unlike an assessment of a different kind of subject, right? It's unlike mathematics or physics. Um, and I personally feel that, uh, you know, using a quote unquote trick kind of questions actually does our learning a little bit more of a disservice than a service. We do want children to read the, the text. I get it. We do want children to respond to the best of their ability. Absolutely. But um, uh, there are ways to get creative and assess a different kind of their thinking by using terminology that does not involve a negation. Uh, and that's where it kind of, you know, it, it falls on us as creators of MCQs to uh, you know, to kind of uh, keep all these things in mind uh, while drafting questions um, as we go. Uh, ensure the distractors are grammatically consistent with the STEM. I think this is such a, such a core key rule and it's so simple, but it is the rule in which we make the most amount of mistakes. In fact, uh, you know, I had done this exercise where uh, there was a group of uh, 300 to 350 teachers and uh, we had done this whole session and we, we ran this exercise and there was an assignment that had to be done after. And while checking uh, the responses to the assignment, uh, this was the error that came up the most to ensure that the distractors are grammatically consistent with the STEM. Uh, who can tell me what the issue here uh, is with this test item? We have used an article. And yeah. So essentially, we have given out the answer to an intelligent, you know, to, to any child. Like we've absolutely given out the answer, right? Uh, and this is a very simple explanation of the grammatical piece. Uh, there are much more complex cases as well. Uh, you know, we either kind of use a slash an in the stem, or we just say a baby baboon is called dash an infant, a pup, a kid, a baby. So you can use the uh, articles in front of your options, right? Now, this also applies to things like punctuation, uh, capitalization, uh, you know, using the right punctuation marks at the end of a sentence. Uh, it's, it's very, very important. Like if you see here, there is in the stem itself, uh, on the box on the right hand side, uh, a baby baboon is called a uh, and dash and there is a full stop at the end of the dash. So it is assumed that this sentence will, uh, you know, will be completed by one of the distractors by A, B, C or D and it will become a whole sentence with a full stop at the end. If you don't use a full stop in the stem, 
you must put a full stop after the uh, after the distractors so a baby baboon is called a and dash infant full stop pop full stop kid full stop baby full stop right um, and capitalization if the options or the distractors are in continuation with a sentence it should not be in capitals right the first letter should not be capitals it is simple simple hygiene um, and it is uh, it is because it is so simple and everyone knows it it is what everyone forgets to do and i tell you this uh, after lots and lots of experience so you know making sure that your distractors are grammatically consistent with the stem very 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 important and this one right the length of all the distractors needs to be similar uh, can i request someone to please read uh, the whole test item komala last week to read uh, yes yes you know ma'am sorry you began to read i'm so sorry yes ma'am what would a philatelist be concerned with option a the study of stamps b the way knowledge is acquired c the way postal systems are made d where words in a language come from including when and why uh, and uh, would anyone know what is the right answer here what is the key to this question the study of stamps the study of stamps study of stamps right uh, and if you look at the way the distractors are formed um, what can you tell us about the length of the distractors they all are unequal and which one is the longest d yeah correct so uh, more often than not uh, especially when we have children who are not uh you know not very well prepared with the material um or children who are prepared but are less confident most of the time they will go in for the response which is the longest or the shortest um and often we do have uh, i can see some teachers are smiling so i know that you have experienced this in your classrooms as well where children tend to mark that answer which looks the longest or which looks the shortest uh you know because in inherently our children also think that oh ma'am is trying to trick me or sir is trying to trick me although i think this is the right answer but this looks the longest so this must be the case children are playing their own kind of mind games uh, uh, you know while they are uh, in class uh, yes i believe there is a question uh, anu ma'am um aditi this yes. question i would uh, the distractors i would like write like this Mm. A original words. B mm. study of stamps. Mm. C. Uh, I'll now I'll put the way language is learned. Mm. And um, D maybe uh, the way postal systems are made. Mm. Uh, now how postal systems are made, I would not use. And I I'll use them as phrases. and mm. not a not put a full stop after it. Yeah, correct. You're right. Absolutely. And I will not begin with a capitalization. I would uh, prefer using. um i i would prefer uh, writing the first letter of the phrase with a small uh, yeah and in absolutely in fact now that you have uh, brought it to our attention i will make that change right away uh one sec you are right these are phrases because we don't have words uh, we don't have verbs here mostly so and i, like I would you... drop the from the first probably because it's just a repetition and it's not required a uh, original words mm. if you want to retain you may it's okay but uh, yeah i i would want to retain because i want only a one word difference between uh, the four distractors okay. uh, you know so in terms of length so no thank you so much anu ma'am this is this is amazing so uh, you know uh, i uh, while i was saying a lot of us were also uh, you know they were smiling because children do have that tendency to respond to uh, options or distractors that look the longest uh, and as teachers sometimes uh, you know we have created a fabulous test item um, but the uh, and the purpose of the test item is to really check a higher order thinking skill in a child but the way we create the options in fact does not give the child that uh, the the possibility to demonstrate higher order thinking skills so creating of the uh, mcq is is super duper crucial uh, completely 
so we have gone through five rules we have to go through five rules uh once more so i just want to uh you know give us the opportunity if you want to stretch or move or drink a glass of water then please you are you are very very welcome um okay and just to quickly recap the rules that we have learned so far uh the item must the stem must contain a self contained question the stem must contain as much of the item's content as possible uh, avoid negative working make sure that uh, the you know the stem and the distractors are in grammatical alignment with each other and the length of distractors too should be similar um so far so good if you can just show me a quick thumbs up that these five simple rules are clear great thank you so much uh you can even put thumbs up in chat okay super okay now uh uh the next one uh rule number 6 is that all the alternatives need to be reasonable or probable uh let's take this test item uh for instance uh komal can i request you to read this test item yes thank you aditi uh, which of the following artist is known for the for painting the ceiling of sistine chapel a ross from friends b homer simpson c michael angelo d tom hanks now what is the issue with this test item and what is the issue with the distractors here i last saba ma'am because she has this lovely smile on her face that i can see see the children would definitely homer simpson they would know it's a uh, it's a, a cartoon character and yeah. tom hanks is a film actor okay yeah. so they would immediately ross from friends is again a character it, from one of the so they will eventually be left with just one uh, option that's yeah. it yeah uh and uh you know uh this that's why we say that while creating the distractors of an mcq all the options need to be reasonable or probable because this just becomes a aja ta 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 even so you're not uh, as a creator of the mcq you're not testing my skill in any way you're just testing my elimination knowledge or you're testing my knowledge of things outside of the question and not this right uh versus uh, if you see the options on the right sorry yeah. uh botticelli da vinci michelangelo raphael now uh, if you see these all these artists are from around the same time period they are all italian they are all um uh, you know the, the their uh, names are also more or less like similar in terms of spelling uh, you know the letter of the, the number of letters in their names is also here and there similar so uh, a lot of kind of different things have to be considered and we have to make sure that uh, while creating mcqs all the distractors need to be probable uh essentially uh you know easy or silly distractors reduce the validity of the assessment um and see while we are giving an assessment right there are multiple factors at play one is that we have created something the second is the child has come in a serious way to give an assessment right even if it's a surprise test in a class uh there is a kind of silence that sets in and the word test or the word assessment is related with an inherent seriousness within us uh so even if you're giving a surprise test in the classroom suddenly you say okay surprise test everybody settle down and you know there'll be like a pall of silence and people will start doing the test seriously and uh uh you know easy or silly distractors they reduce the validity of the assessment in the child's mind they reduce the seriousness that they associate with an assessment uh so uh you know everything has its time and place uh for certain silly assessments absolutely do it but for the more serious ones make sure that all the alternatives are reasonable or probable and all the alternatives must be independently true and what do i mean by this now uh, if we look at the test item that's on the screen uh, you know what is the side effect of prolonged consumption of aspirin aspirin is a medication that we all know it's a blood thinner um, and people who have uh, cardiac issues or people who have had a stroke are usually put on some kind of a blood thinner right uh what is the side effect of prolonged consumption of aspirin blood it causes blood to become thinner it causes stomach ulcers it can uh, damage liver function all of the above or a and b now a lot of the times we tend to use uh, all of the above none of the above kind of answers in our distractors now every time a child sees all of the above or none of the above uh they know that they only have to make a choice between 
two out of the four distractors in order to find a key. Now, if they find that two things are correct, they will automatically choose all of the above uh, or they will automatically choose A and B. Um, so again, uh, in a way, the validity of the assessment uh, reduces. And it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, when all four options need you to think a little bit, uh, it makes the assessment more challenging and it gives you, the teacher, the tools you need to understand how children are thinking about something, processing it, and then giving a response. Um, so this is a more uh, around, uh, you know, not using all of the above or none of the above uh, as distractors in our uh, MCQs. Uh, distractors should not be subsets of other distractors. This is also uh, quite uh, quite. Um, can I request somebody, uh, Komal? Can I request you to read this uh, test item? Where did the explorers stop before they reached South America? A. Japan. B. Asia. C. New Zealand. D. Hokkaido. Uh, who can tell me what is the issue here? Rest are Asian countries and one is the non-Asian country. Uh, but is, uh, is no, Asian Hokkaido Asian? is in Japan. Hokkaido uh, is in Japan. Okay. Japan. And uh, Japan part of is Japan, in Asia. Japan. Yes. And Japan is Japan in Asia. Japan is in Asia, correct. Yeah. And uh, New Zealand is kind of back of the, <laughs> at the bottom of the globe. Mm, so it's yes. something else, right? So um, essentially, when we look at this, um, in this case, if uh, Hokkaido is the correct answer or if Hokkaido is the key, then A also becomes the correct answer and B also becomes the correct answer in a way. Because Hokkaido is in Japan, so yes, Japan could be correct. The explorers stopped in Japan. Japan is in Asia. The other option that I have is New Zealand, which is in a completely different continent. So yes, Asia also could be correct. Uh, and if uh, distractors are subsets of another, then as, a, as an assessor or as someone who is uh, giving the test, there is no way that we can say that this is the absolute correct answer or this is the absolute incorrect answer. And especially in this case, this is a recall kind of a question, right? This is a factual question. Uh, this is not based on perception. This is not based on what I feel about where the explorer stopped. The explorer stopped in a certain place and that place is Hokkaido. Now, the uh, a better way to ask this question is, uh, you know, either kind of do a country level, uh, you know, give the distractors as all names of countries or give distractors as all names of cities and make sure that the cities are not a part of the same country or make sure that all the four uh, cities are a part of the same country and the stem could be uh, written as... Uh, a, a, which Japani, which Japanese city did the explorer stop in before they reached South America, right? Um, and these are uh, questions that we uh, uh, that we ask very often. And I'm also looking at the notes that we have on chat. And Hazel, ma'am, Ronak ji, Sabha, ma'am, uh, uh, all of them have kind of uh, all of them have said that yes, it is. Uh, you know, the distractors include the name of the country and the city, um, and there are. It is an it is an issue, right? You can see how it's impossible to to give like if you had to give one mark or two marks for each MCQ in this for the box on the left, how would you score the child? Uh, the distractor should not overlap in meaning. This is another uh, you know kind of a continuation of. I'm sorry, just excuse me a second. Uh, this is the continuation of what we covered earlier. Um, if we look at this particular uh, test item, uh, and if I could just request all of you to read this item uh, in your mind, I'm just going to get a sip of water. And once you've read it, I would love for someone to tell me how option number C and D could overlap in meaning. Option A and B both mean the same, just differently worded. Mm -hmm. Okay, and similarly C and D? 
Okay. He wished his father had not sold the land and then he resented his father's. So they mean the same. It's just differently worded. That's all. Hmm. So again, like the issue that we had in the earlier rule where distractors were subsets of each other. In this case, the distractors overlap in meaning. And when they overlap in meaning, uh, you know, it is essentially, uh, how will you assess that the child has given the right answer? Uh, if the distractors that we have formed are kind of similar and they mean the same. Uh, and so if we look at the options that are on the right, uh, the test item on the right, uh, you know, the distractors mean uh, different things. And then it's easier to have uh, uh, one common correct answer for this particular question. Uh, the last couple of rules, uh, and this is quite simple which is that the distractor should be simpler to understand than the test item. Uh, so let's look at this, right? The context that we have here is a new planet that's the right size and location to support life has been discovered 20 light years away. What is special about the new planet? And if you can just very uh, quickly in your mind, read the four distractors that we have. What can you tell me about the way the test item is phrased versus the way the distractors are phrased? Anyone perhaps who's not spoken before, I'd love to hear um, your voice. I like to have a go at it. I'm yes, not Vanda, sure. ma'am, please. Absolutely. Okay. So I think that, you know, the statement at the top, which is in red, uh -huh. it has quite a few special things about the new planet in it, uh -huh. if that's what we are trying to get at. For example, it's the right size. That's a special thing about it. Then the location to support life. So it's it's life supporting conditions. It has, That is also a special thing about it. Uh -huh. And then how far away it is. Okay. That is also perhaps a special, you know, information about it. Uh -huh. And then... Um, when we look at the options below, mm -hmm. uh, it is relatively close to another planetary body. There is a possibility that conditions exist which would support unknown organisms. Um, the statement at the top is very simple to understand, whereas, mm. you know, what is written underneath, it perhaps is saying the same thing, but it has been made much more complicated. Correct. So the distractors are more complicatedly phrased than the test item. And it is more, uh, sorry, was someone saying anything? It is more likely that a child will be quite confused while answering this question because the simplicity of the test item is very different compared to the simplicity of the distractors. Um, and like ma'am said, uh, you know, it does the, the context as before the test item does give us this clue that, you know, what is special about this particular planet is it you know it has it's the right size and location to support life life support being the most crucial factor of this new planet um and uh, if you you know it's it's equally easy to to simplify the distractors from the left to the right so it becomes easier for a child to respond to the questions you can absolutely make the test item more complex if you wish if you wish the children show more depth and more detailed understanding, you can make the test item more complicated and then you can have the distractor slightly less complicated than the test item. That is also a possibility. And here is, uh, you know, uh, we were talking about uh, trick questions earlier as well. Uh, and this is a very personal uh, belief that I have. It's not necessary that all of us have to follow it. Uh, but I feel like the purpose of an assessment is to test knowledge, not to trick children. And making uh, a test question overly complex does not make the assessment rigorous. What makes the assessment rigorous is actually making sure that we have followed the rules that we have spoken about. Because if you sit to create MCQs with all these 12 rules in mind, trust me, you will not be able to create more than 15 to 20 questions a day. It is a very demanding job. It takes a lot of brain space. It's actually easier to create trick questions because we're just asking things in a twisted way and giving twisted options. And in some cases, it's fine. 
but if we really want to go back to the initial uh, instruction design piece that we saw and we want to go back to the whole um uh, 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 you know, making sure that there is purposeful creation and then there is alignment between the creation and the learning methods and the assessment. Uh, in that situation, I would, uh, you know, I would personally, in I would personally not use strict questions because they could interfere with the test validity. And uh, okay, so what I would like to quickly go back to is we have looked at 10 rules uh, or 10 guidelines of creating MCQs. Uh, yes, Preet Mala, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, would you like to unmute and ask something? Preet Mala ji? Okay. Uh, you can also put something in chat, ma'am. Uh, your hand is raised, so I'll just uh, uh, request you to write whatever you need in chat. Uh, uh, just to do a quick recap of the 10 rules that we have studied. One is that the STEM must contain uh, as much of the items. Five, of six, content. six, seven, three, two. Five, six, uh, six, seven, three, two. Five, six, six, seven, three, two. Five, six, five, six, just, six, seven, three. Uh, Komal, if you can help put everyone on mute. Thank you. Um, so the, Excuse me, ma'am. Yes, uh, yes, ma'am. I just had a question about uh, this distractor that we were talking about. If I'm not mistaken, this is the dist uh, number seven. Okay. Um, no, I think it was number six, ma'am. When we were talking about uh, this, yes. Yes, yes. Now, over here, ma'am, uh, you said that, you know, easy or silly distractors reduce the validity. But you know the question on the right-hand side, mm -hmm. when you're, um, what I've seen is that where, if you're making questions, um, you may have done a specific person, say over here, Michael Angelo probably is the key. Mm -hmm. And you've spoken about him, but the mm -hmm. other characters, the other people, Hmm. are nowhere in the text. So it becomes for a kid who hasn't heard these names hmm. is going to find the other names silly as it is. So I do not understand unless you have done these names and they're closely or somewhere associated and are in the content. Right. You're absolutely right, ma'am. Um, the assumption behind this question is that you know, the child knows that all of these are also painters and the and what they have to figure out is which which artist has painted this particular piece. Uh, in a case where the child has only learned that uh, Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel and that is all that they have learned, then uh, I would perhaps not use that item uh, to create an MCQ because it will again, uh, you know, it will again be the same thing because uh, for the child who is not known anything about Botticelli or, my, or Da Vinci or Raphael, it will become just like the uh, test item on the left, right? All the other options will be equally mindless. So you're absolutely right. Uh, this depends on the context that we have taught the children. And this question comes from the assumption that the children know that uh, all the four in the key or uh, in the distractors are painters. And what they have to find is uh, which person has painted this particular piece of art. So you're, oh. you're right, Preet ma'am. Yes. Okay, so to uh, repeat the rules that uh, we have been talking about, uh, one is that the STEM must contain the self-contained question. It must contain as much of the item's content as possible. We avoid negative working. We make sure that there's grammatical alignment between the uh, distractors and the, uh, and the test and the STEM. Uh, we make sure that the length of the distractors is similar. Uh, we make sure that all the alternatives are reasonable and probable. Uh, we make sure that all the alternatives are also independently true, which means we don't give all of the above or none of the above or, or A and B or B and C or C and B or E and F as the uh, as options. Um, distractors also should not be subsets of other distractors because it becomes impossible to 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 give that mark for the correct answer. Uh, the distractors also should not overlap in meaning because similar uh, issues as number eight. 
and the last bit is that this chapter should be simpler to understand than the test item. So, uh, so all good. Uh, so all the 10 rules are quite clear. And like I was saying, what I would, uh, you know, what I would absolutely request all of us to do is to make sure that these questions for our colleagues, our, our team members, members in our team, uh, these questions are written down in, uh, uh, you know, on a piece of paper and stuck on the staff room somewhere uh, because these rules are useful not only for English, but for any language heavy subject such as social science or history uh, or the theoretical chapters in science as well. Okay, uh, so the last 10 minutes uh, of the session that we have left, I just want to dedicate a little bit to, uh, you know, uh, HOTS questions. Uh, HOTS, obviously, all of us know it stands for higher order thinking skills. Uh, and in an assessment, uh, we began with the word purpose when we were talking about instruction design. Uh, and in the in assessments, each question also has a purpose, right? What skill do we actually want to measure? And um, how do we decide that, oh, this question is measuring this skill in a child, or this question is measuring this skill in a child, or this set of these set of questions are measuring these skills. You can have 15 questions dedicated to comprehension. But within comprehension also, there are lots of sub-skills, right? Um, uh, evaluate is one, recall is one, understand is one. So how do I know that the question that I'm asking, what skill is it actually going to measure? And here our secret weapon is uh, good old Mr. Bloom and uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, and I want to introduce Bloom's taxonomy based tagging. Now, what do I mean by this? All of us have seen uh, what the Bloom's triangle looks like. And we know that there are a set of skills that go from remember to create. Remember being the lowest order skill and create being the highest order skill that there is. Uh, and you can see that apply, analyze, and evaluate have been circled in this case. That is because uh, in an assessment that has something to do with English, uh, uh, apply, analyze, and evaluate can still be quite uh, reasonably assessed through multiple choice questions. You know, the skill to create um, or certain parts of analysis can only be create can only be assessed through more uh, you know formative questions but apply analyze and evaluate which are you know not remembering and not understanding uh, categories above them can be reasonably assessed through multiple choice questions and so uh, you know i recommend this kind of a tagging table uh, that helps us know okay so what exactly am i asking what sub skill am i looking at and what are the kinds of tasks that i can use to create these questions and creating a master table like this for the whole academic year could help you create really good quality high-end questions for uh, reading comprehension based tasks in English. So, you know, if you look at the skill uh, in comprehension and comprehension, we have multiple parts making inferences is one. Uh, so, you know, the core skill is making inferences. The sub skill is connecting two pieces of information. And what is the right task that will suit this skill, uh, you know, is the kind of tabular thinking that I'm saying uh, we should do. Uh, this takes a little bit of time because this is slightly more theoretical in nature. Uh, and dedicating one week to this will make sure that for the whole year, your uh, MCQ creation process becomes very, very simple. And this is a matrix that is, uh, you know, that is going to develop and that is going to keep getting richer and richer with time. Um, and then another piece that you can add to the table later on is the difficulty level of that question. Is this easy or is this difficult? And this is based on our own, our own assumption of what is easy for the child and what is difficult for the child. This then has to change with the data that we get. Say, for example, we ran an MCQ assessment for 100 children in one class. Uh, we assume that this particular question was very easy. But when the data came back to us, we saw that 65 children out of 100 got that question wrong, which means that actually what we think is easy turns out to be slightly more difficult for the child. So this kind of Bloom's based tagging table really helps us uh, elevate our MCQs to a slightly more higher level. Uh, this is complex and I get it. And I'm, you know, Pomal uh, uh, and team, we will send you this, this later and you can create your pieces. And if you want, we'll be happy to look at some creation as well, just to see if it's on the right track. 
uh and so um you know when we talk about drafting hot questions of course looking at blooms and doing the bloom based tagging is one thing is is one route the other route is just having certain uh principles in place right so a, a good hot question is something that has memory and application and a good hot question is something that uh that has real life skill application uh you know where the child is required to understand the context and then apply the facts to answer a question um and like you know i'll just give you an example of a memory plus application based question very simple uh the box on the left is only memory right which description best characterizes whole foods so which of these things are a whole food item oranges toast brand grapefruit versus uh adding a little bit more context to it uh and then asking the child to choose um uh, you know choose a response from here um so memory and application is one very simple way to elevate a lower order thinking question to a higher order thinking question uh the other is uh you know where the child is required to answer uh, along with a reason uh and the reason could be obvious which means it could be stated in the stem or the distractor or the child will have to think of oh yeah this could be the reason uh have an implied understanding of it and then choose the answer uh, related to it in the in the mcq so say for example uh you know if i say select the most effective tone for writing technical documentation and it's uh, it's a very simple kind of a you know it's it's kind of straightforward question whereas in this way if you look at uh, you know how the question is drafted on the right select the sentence that best demonstrates uh, how to start a technical doc document so where children have to kind of show a little bit more reasoning um than what was expected uh, in the box on the left and then uh, choose the right answer um and this is also you know these kinds of questions are also a little bit more fun for for us to create uh because the normal questions do get very very tiring where you just have to ask a question and then give four options and then you have to be like oh they have to be grammatically correct oh they have to be the same length oh they can't be subsets oh and then we automatically run out of ideas these kinds of slightly more creative questions help us also as creators of mcqs uh remain a little bit more uh active and interested in the process it it reduces our fatigue uh and scenario based questions that stimulate real life experiences are also a great way to uh, look at um hot questions um so if you look at what is the first concern of an emergency medical technician um at the scene of an accident versus giving a little bit of a context as you can see um uh, in the test item on the right and then uh, you know asking the children to choose uh what seems to be the best answer in this case um so you know scenario based questions obviously uh quite quite interesting you are able to see the difference between the two right you can show me a quick thumbs up yeah super and the last bit is uh, for a higher order thinking question use visuals visuals are actually really really uh uh you know uh, and if you have even if it if, even if you have the option to give a printed assessment uh and um uh you know even if it's a printed assessment and even if it is just or it could be something that children have to do digitally uh, the use of visuals is is a superb idea uh you know uh so we look at this this is a uh, you know this visual became very popular when anand mahindra tweeted about it and uh, you know it spoke about certain things that women have to face that men don't uh, and it's a great way to uh, you know to see how critically children are able to think um, you know when you give a picture and then you see okay you know so what is the best description of what this image is trying to say no problem only uh, if i can just request the team to go on mute so you know this is also a great way uh, to check uh, you know to to transform a lot store thoughts um uh and then using multi logical thinking uh you know basically this is a, a an example of a two tiered thinking question where the children have to look at two or three sets of information that has been given earlier and then 
uh, decide, oh, this could be the right answer because this. And so like Anu ma'am was also saying in the beginning, uh, why do we use uh, choose the best response and not the correct response, right? Because in these cases, uh, we want children to demonstrate how they are thinking about a certain situation and then choose that response. Uh, so multi-logical thinking or multi-tier thinking is also a great way to transform uh, lots into our hearts. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we started with Blooms. Uh, I'd like to kind of close with Blooms as well. This is a great table that tells us all the Blooms taxonomy verbs. You have remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. Uh, and if you look at the set of words that are under each, uh, under each bold word, like under remember, you have define, list, recall. Under understand, you have restate, summarize, explain, illustrate, give example, match, classify. These are verbs that are great examples of how to start a question to assess this particular skill. If you want to assess children's understanding, you could start a formative question or an objective question with summarize, blah, 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 or choose the most accurate summary of this particular passage. And then you could give four options. Uh, in the same way, if we look at uh, evaluate, um, you know, we could have a question like, uh, so and so happened in Act One, Scene Four of *The Merchant of Venice*. Uh, defend Antonio's Antonio's behavior at this point, for instance, right? And then you can give four options as to why that behavior needs to be defended. Uh, so these are a great set of verbs to kind of again print and keep in front of us in our staff room or wherever, uh, because whenever we are creating questions, these starter verbs are supremely useful and if you look at all the words that are on top of the blue color staircase right like on top of uh, remember you have lecture visuals video audio examples illustrations analogies uh, we began by talking about purposeful creation for easy application and to create content that suits the need in a child to say remember something suits your need to help them explain something or to apply something the words on top are essentially exercises or the kinds of learning tools that you can use or give in a classroom uh, for these particular higher order tasks. Uh, if you want to give exercise in analysis, case studies are great. Uh, you know, problem solving is great. But if you want to just uh, ask the children to apply something that they have learned, role playing, teaching something back to you or to their uh, peer in the classrooms, uh, doing group projects are a great way to test these particular skills. Uh, so this this is also kind of quite easy and it's it's made life easy for us. Uh, and we know that, yes, okay, we can absolutely use this, uh, you know, this ready reckoner for us in the classrooms. So just to, uh, uh, you know, think about the lots to the hots uh, and what makes a hot question. Uh, you have something that uses memory and application both. Um, only memory becomes a recall question, but memory plus application would become something that a child would need to say apply or analyze, which becomes a hot skill. Uh, answer plus reason, we are kind of, you know, giving the answer with an implicit reason uh, is also becomes an application kind of question. And so it becomes a higher order thinking question. And scenario based questions that stimulate real life experiences, of course, you know, kind of they make the children go in that place, in that location, kind of in their mind, empathize with what's happening and then uh, use their logic and reason to choose the correct answer. Uh, and then using visuals uh, to help us describe something and using multi-tiered, multi-logical thinking. Uh, these are all great ways to transform lots into huts. Um, and especially for children in higher grades, uh, this is something that, uh, you know, uh, this is something that you, that you want. Um, so I know that we are, uh, you know, past 6 p.m. And I just want to quickly, uh, you know, ask you if these two test items pass the test, right? Um, if someone can read this whole test item and see if it is from the 10 rules that we learned earlier, if this test item passes the test or not, you can just give me the reasoning.
let's look at all the distractors what what is coming out about the distractors the distractors are not of the same length that's the first yeah correct correct so distractors are not of the same length so one test these these distractors don't pass then yeah seema ma'am said unequal length yeah correct uh, also the grammatical uh, alignment is not there uh, you know these are full sentences they don't begin with the capitals they don't end with a full stop so grammatically the distractors are not linked to what the stem is um we have got an answer saying that the all the distractors highlight a different emotions uh which is which is what it should be because the question is how does the duke feel so if the question is how does the duke feel then of course the you know different kinds of feelings have to be in the distractor but the distractors have to be drafted in a much better way they have to be grammatically significant they have to be of the same length and uh, you know uh, they have to follow rules of grammar um so you know that's it that's that's where we are uh, uh, i i quickly i really thank you for your time and for joining me this evening uh, i hope you had a wonderful time i i had a great time meeting you all uh, if there are any questions i'm happy to take them now otherwise i'm you know i'm happy to stay back for five more minutes uh, others are welcome to leave thank you so much for your time and for anything else i'm here if you need uh, and komal these resources will be shared with everyone on the call correct Yes, uh, so we'll be sharing the recording of the session along with the resources and the presentation with everyone. Uh, we'll take around, we'll share it by Monday latest. Uh, I know it's past six o'clock. If anyone, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, I know it's an evening time and everything, but uh, your participation, you being in the session, means a lot to us. Uh, while I know it's a rush time in the evening, if you wish to leave, we are fine with that. If anyone has questions, Aditi and I am there. You can ask your questions, and we can wrap the session. in 10 minutes uh if anyone has a question please raise your hand unmute and ask uh, else you all can uh, later also if you have a question you can write to us and we'll be happy to revert to you uh aditi i think your session was very clear uh, we don't see any questions coming up thank you so much aditi for taking out time and taking a wonderful session and thank you everyone it was an absolutely delightful session and we really enjoyed the participation from everyone thank you once again nothing, thank you aditi nothing better than uh, starting you. the new year with with so many lovely teachers thank you so much everyone see you soon thank you so much everyone thank you bye bye everyone